Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so I guess the uh, the question that we begin with is um, both of us are horror writers, uh, so I'm sorry we're not actually going to be talking much about uh, science fiction and fantasy, except as part of the speculative package. Um, all the specifics are going to be pretty much about horror. Um, and from the beginning, we asked ourselves, what does queer horror mean as a term? Um, and it's, it's interesting from the point of view of Michael and I being a, a bit of a tiny rainbow coalition in two. that. Uh, you have two. In that I am a self-identified straight woman who's married to a dude and has a kid and writes what most people would say is, if, if not um, completely queer horror, but very, very queer friendly horror. Uh, indeed, the first story that I ever uh, sold professionally had a lesbian protagonist, and at the time it was just like, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's what happened. But very quickly, um, in the early dog days of like the uh, very late 1980s to very early 1990s, when I was first trying to break into horror as a genre, because that was the genre that I was interested in, um, the thing that I consistently found um, was that the mainstream horror, which, what a ridiculous term, because <laughs> horror is like a ghetto inside a ghetto inside a ghetto, you know, um, if you like it, you really like it, but very few people really like it. Um, and it doesn't, uh, as, as, as Dave pointed out, it doesn't travel very well. And it particularly doesn't travel well if you're also doing something that uh, makes it even less quote, quote, mainstream, that when, makes it even less yeah. the default. When the first uh, Queer Fear book came out, I believe it was 1999, there was nothing on the landscape at all dealing with exclusively gay horror. Um, a publishing company in New York called Allison Books had done some uh, erotic erotic horror stories with more emphasis on the erotica and I always had the feeling that the erotica was there to convince people to buy the book because they wouldn't buy it just as the horror. Um, and what we wanted to do with the, the Queer Fear books, there was only one at the time, we wanted to get books or stories that were um, across the board publishable in any other anthology except with uh, queer characters. Um, we, we initially we're going to be, you know, more more inclusive uh, with with a lot of lesbian, you know, lesbian and bisexual stuff. But we didn't get that. We mostly got gay men writing writing horror fiction, and a lot of fascinatingly enough, a lot of straight men um, agreed to contribute to this. And some of the best stories were were from these straight guys. And of course, um, I published uh, Gemma's story, Bare Shirt, in the first Queer Fear, which was one of the the best received stories in in the book. And we got to know each other a little bit, and it. It is kind of illustrative of the idea that if you are in fact a gifted writer in in, in horror or, or really in any other genre, um, sexual orientation or life experience should by necessity be able to um, uh, surpass uh, background and, I, and lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like a again, it's word. it's like Bob was saying. Um, life is obviously important. Uh, life experience is important as a writer, but particularly when you're a speculative writer. Um, I, I, I think what you take away from your own life experiences is a kind of emotional grounding. It's like, now I understand what it's like to love somebody who doesn't love me. Now I understand what it's like to be, you know, emotionally kicked in the nads. Um, even now, if you don't have nads. Exactly. <laughs> even if you don't have nads. Um, now I understand what it's like to be afraid of death. Now I understand what it's like to have something that is worth being afraid of losing. Those are the things which are consistent and those are the things which are useful. But if you, particularly if you write speculative fiction, everything else is up for grabs. Everything else is wide open and should be wide open. Um, within the context of uh, queer horror as a, as a genre, um, let's, let's go back, let's go way, 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 way back and think about the idea of gay and lesbian themes in horror, um, where you are, you, you know, you begin with a, with a genre which is by nature othering. <laughs> it's about monsters. It's about, you know, wow, I hope that doesn't happen to me, or you know, wow, I hope I'm not the thing that could do things to mm -hmm. other people, that they would go, wow, I hope that doesn't happen to me. Um, and this is why when you, um, when you open up the, the subject of representation 
in horror when you say, well, you know, there are gay people in the world, right? And bi people and queer people and intersex people and trans people and whoever who's not, you know, Joe Sixpack down the street um, with the 2.5. Or Jane, Jane Sixpack, you know. Whoever's not the default, those people exist as well. Wouldn't it be nice to see them in this story? Then you have to deal with the fact that, but it's not a nice story, because <laughs> it's horror, man. <laughs> so, you know, by saying I'm going to represent these people in this story, am I then opening myself up to charges of representativeness? Am I saying, well, there are two gay dudes in this story and something awful happens to them. Does that mean I think something awful should happen to, to, to all gay dudes because they're gay dudes? This is, the, this is the thing that you're playing with constantly and you're playing with it in horror generally, but you're particularly playing with it when you bring in intersectional issues, when you bring in the non-default. Even, even uh, further back, um, the, the question about writing for publication was, was quite striking in, uh, from the lady in the uh, third row. Because the idea of publishing stories with, with queer characters is a very relatively new phenomenon. Um, off the top of my head, I remember a book that came out in 1974 uh, by Jeffrey Condit. It's called The Sentinel. And it was made into a truly dreadful movie. But it was really a bad novel as well. But one of, the things that, one of the things that the novel did fairly gratuitously was help itself to stereotypes. Uh, there were a couple of lesbians uh, that were like out of the, the sort of butch femme nightmare library. You know, and, and, and they, they, Kill your sister George right, type people. Precisely. And their purpose, their purpose was to disgust. And I think that it, in the same way that horror is so representative of so many other shifts in culture, I think when you go back... And Gemma will talk about Carmilla a little bit and the effect of that uh, uh, in, the, in the last century. But contemporary horror fiction has only recently, relatively recently, become comfortable with the idea of queer characters at all. And that has everything to do with the marketplace. It has to do with the, usually, whether straight men are going to have some ick factor response to some scene. And placing your monsters in the, in the pantheon of, of horror fiction ha is something that's changed. Today you can actually have monsters that are just monsters because they're monsters. Back in the 70s and the early 80s, the gay characters, and to a lesser degree the lesbian characters because straight men like lesbians as a rule, so they're, they're, they're marketable. Um, the, the gay character was intended to disgust or to appall or to horrify, but not in a sort of honorable monster kind of way. Yeah, more in the sense that it was the sexuality that rendered these people monsters. Um, you know, and, and, and you can go into why that, why that is or why that might be. Why male-on-male -male sexuality might be seen as predatory and tainting inherently, whereas female-on-female -female sexuality might be seen as, ooh, excellent. Um, <laughs> because particularly from the straight male perspective, um, you know, it is pretty much the penthouse spread idea. The idea that, you know, these two ladies are just doing something, but I'm the only person with a penis here. So... And then and, she opened her mouth and she had fangs. That's right. Oh, oh, that was so gross and yet kind of, kind of nice. Because my penis was still there. Um, <laughs> you know, the problem is that while you're being, uh, to some degree, and enticed to participate in that sort of, um, you know, in, in that sort of, scenario, the idea is that, you know, oh my god, that menage might become a threesome, even though it makes no freaking sense at all because they're both lesbians and you're a straight dude, but whatever. You know, ladies are like that. They're open all areas, open all access. Um, <laughs> uh, just by design, nature did it. Um, but, you know, the problem is that it, if you uh, then reimagine that as two guys, you're not thinking, oh, I hope they ask me to play with them. You're thinking, Which oh, God, I hope they don't ask me to play with them. Participation by the reader. I was asked once uh, to contribute a uh, story to an anthology, uh, an erotic horror anthology uh, that I will not name. Um, the editor had, must have woken up this morning feeling inclusive, and he said, we'd really like to have a gay story in here. And we talked a little bit, and then he, he sort of was very nervous, and then he said, well, we don't want it to be too gay. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, that, that was one of those magic moments because, of course, um, how do you do that? And, and what, what are you really saying? It, it becomes, one of the functions of art is to, is to be participatory and to engage the reader. And if, if the editor in question is doing it because he thinks he should, because it, it's a good thing to do, that's not going to make art. 
and it certainly didn't make art in this particular case. The series didn't last. But it, it does raise some very interesting questions about who's reading who and who's writing what. And, and uh, Yeah, um, you know, I, as, as I said, I, my, my formative years were the 80s. And when I think back um, to the people who really influenced me uh, to begin writing horror, uh, as opposed to the really crappy science fiction that I started with, or space opera, really, more than science fiction, because I don't know a lot about science, man. I just don't. <laughs> Um, <laughs> because my math skills are really shitty. Anyways, um, you know, it's like Stephen King, Peter Straub, Clive Barker. And the interesting thing with Barker um, was not just that he paved the way for, uh, for stuff that was equally sexually inclusive and happened to be written by women, which was even more exciting. You know, it's like, oh my God, Poppy Bright, oh my God, Caitlin Kernan, oh my God, Kathy Kojo, oh my God. I'm like that, in that I am a chick who's interested in, the, in these things. But the, the, thing with, um, the thing with Barker was that when he first published the Books of Blood, yeah, it became fairly quickly clear that he was in fact gay. But he was not pumping on that. It's not his subject. Yeah, it was not his subject matter. Um, and, and, even, and even just presenting himself to the world, he, he just wouldn't say anything. He'd be like, yeah, well, whatever. You know, you can ask that. <laughs> um, but I'm just not going to be specific. Um, but the wonderful thing about his stories was not only that they kicked ass and not only that they were poetic and dark and fierce and crazy, but that everything was there. Everything was available. They were polymorphously perverse in the best kind of way. And so you had gay protagonists, and you had straight protagonists, and you had lesbian protagonists, and you had, you know, men who turned into women, and women who turned into men, and, uh, and a guy who took way too much of uh, a sex-inducing uh, drug uh, and ended up having sex with a wall, you know, <laughs> because everything was sexy to him. Everything! You know, which, um, which gave readers permission to be able to enjoy it because these subjects in, in, in a skilled hand are very, very different than when you sit around thinking about whether or not you want it or if you have these, these characters popping up in, in very bad paperback novels. Yeah. The thing that I loved about Clive Barker is that whenever he talked about anything, you know, and it could be, it could be getting the plague, it could be, you know, watching uh, an ape terror guy's upper skull off like he was removing a balaclava, you know, he made it sound good. <laughs> he made it sound, you know, it, it, like, not, not like it was good, like a good thing, but, you know, good like, wow, I'm kind of not exactly aroused, but I'm very, very engaged. I'm very engaged with that thing that's happening in front of me right, right now. And it doesn't matter how I identify myself because, you know, my mind is bigger than that, and if you can, uh, if you can cause people to engage with the situation and cause people to engage with the characters, 